Rebuilding a vintage open steam launch. This is part 13. Boxing Day 2016. Cleaning up the engine. Looking at the boat layout and removing the rudder. I'm cleaning up the engine using a wire brush. It's the kind of wire brush that has brass bristles. It's not quite as ruthless as a steel bristled wire brush. But it still removes this paint easily. What I'm looking at at the moment is the low pressure cylinder to see whether the nuts are just glued to the steam chest cover like they were on the high pressure cylinder or whether they are properly fitted to the studs and the good news is everything appears to be fine at this side of the engine. As you can see the pipe cladding has been damaged slightly by the vigorous action of the wire brush but I'll fix this very shortly. And in this clip I'm removing the last remnants of the paint from the steam chest cover. Once all the wire brushing is out of the way I can then repair the pipe lagging. I'm just using some cyanoacrylate adhesive and a small screwdriver to guide it into place. For pipe lagging I normally use string. It takes ages, you have to wrap it round the pipe many many times and I seal it as I go with cyanoacrylate adhesive. The stuff that's on this engine I'm not sure about but either way the cyanoacrylate adhesive will fully seal it. While editing this video, I noticed that one part of the casting around one of the cylinder mounting lugs is very rough indeed, so I'm going to use one of these cutting wheels to just clean it up. I'm being very careful with this cutting disc not to accidentally slip onto a visible part of the engine like the steam chest. Once I'd done a rough cut, I took a much finer cut and got quite a smooth finish. I did of course cover up the lower part of the engine, you can't see it in the shot, but the bottom part of the engine where all the bearings are is not being contaminated by any grit and cast iron residue. This clip shows me sticking back a piece of cylinder cladding that fell off when I used the wire brush. The cladding on this engine is not really very neat, but it looks okay, it has a certain rustic charm. While I still had this abrasive cutting disc in the small mini drill, I took this golden opportunity to shorten one of the studs to make it match all the others. Even though this stud no longer has a totally unnecessary screw slot in the end, but it just looks better being the same length as the other studs. There now follows a short painting interlude, and this painting interlude features some Humbrol acrylic matte white paint, which is quite good stuff for painting steam engine pipe lagging, and I'm trying really hard not to get any of this on the existing wooden cladding. The two small spots that you can see are from a previous incarnation of this painting job. And for any viewers watching out there who really enjoy my painting, that's it, there's no more painting. By way of a change now, over to the hull. I've not done anything really with this hull other than look at it and try and figure out the best way to do certain jobs on it. What I'm currently doing, whilst wearing my new shirt that I got for Christmas, is temporarily refitting the boiler on the existing mounting in the hull. Somewhere in this boat I need to fit a condenser oil trap. The purpose of a condenser oil trap is of course to stop the oil from polluting the lake. And the problem with this boat is where to put the condenser oil trap. Where I'd like to put it, there is a water pump in the way. This old water pump takes water from the lake and pumps it into the boiler. This is a terrible idea because even with a small inline filter, you're still going to get dirty water residue in the boiler. So if I do connect up this pump, all it's going to do is suck water out of the lake and then pump the water back out into the lake, not into the boiler, by just opening the bypass valve fully. If I put a horizontal or vertical condenser in this position, it looks stupid, because it's right in front of the fire hole door. Why do we have a fire hole door on a gas fired boiler, you ask? It could be used to stick a lighter in, to light the burner, but you can always light the burner via the chimney. Either way, model or not, a fire hole door, albeit a model fire hole door on a model boiler, must open and look like you could put coal in there. So I think maybe in front of the boiler. There is enough room under the superstructure to put a condenser in here, but the problem is there's going to be a gas burner sticking out there. And while we're on the subject of gas burners, I'd better have a look at the arrangement for the gas cylinder. The only place for the gas cylinder realistically is on a shelf right under the front of the boat. The problem is, a commercial gas valve fitted to this tank is too tall to go underneath there anyway. But I do think I have a suitable idea that will work. I will show it as the build progresses. I suppose if I get really stuck, I could tow the gas tank behind the boat in a small inflatable dinghy. This next bit really had me thinking. This of course is the rudder, and it's very very stiff, 
as this is a pond launch. And in the days of pond launches, you set the rudder, you put the boat in the water with the engine running, and off it went. You ran round the other side of the lake to catch it before it smashed into the side. Sounds like great fun after all the work building a boat like this just to let it roam free around a pond. It's bound to smash into the side at some time. During this rebuild, I'm going to make this boat fully radio controlled, and I was really grateful to the builder for making removing the rudder much simpler than I thought it was going to be. In the end, all I had to do was hold the rudder in a fixed position, then undo the square part with a spanner, and then using the protrusion from the brass washer, I removed that, and underneath the brass washer, I found some aluminium shim washers, which this brass washer presses down onto the deck and locks the rudder in position. The thread, by the way, is 2BA. Withdrawing the rudder was pretty tight, really. I had to sort of pull it out of the skeg at the bottom and hold it to one side. For the radio control system, I think I'm going to refine this a little bit. More about that later. Even with the mechanism removed at the top of the rudder shaft, the rudder shaft in the rudder tube was a very tight fit. And even after I'd run a 316's reamer down the tube, it was still a tight fit. I tried some oil. And it was still a tight fit, but not quite as tight, but too tight for radio control. It's most important to make sure that all mechanical parts of a radio control system are free to move and do not bind in any way. The radio receiver batteries, which also power the servos, have a limited capacity, particularly if you're using dry cells. So any servos in the boat that are stalled or just having trouble moving very stiff parts are going to flatten the battery prematurely. In the end, I removed the rudder stern tube and I'm going to make a new one, a much improved one. Also, I need the rudder to be driven by a servo from inside the boat. Not only am I going to attempt a very sympathetic restoration on this old boat, I'm going to try and make the radio control system invisible. This is the final part of the episode, and you're looking on screen at the moment at a smoke box door ring from a 5 inch gauge Box Hill steam locomotive. And I'm playing about with some ceramic element that I got a while back, and then the fun begins as I turn it into a gas burner. But for the moment, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.